Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Crime Time. Today, we're going to be talking to the author of The Terrorist Son, Zach Ibrahim. And he's going to be talking about his experience growing up with a father who engaged in terrorist activity, first in the shooting of a well of the head of the JDL, and then again in the plotting of the first bombing of the World Trade Center in 1993. So welcome to the show, Zach. Thank you for having me. I'm really glad that you're here. Um, I wanted to, to get a chance to talk to you about your book, which is fascinating, and a, it, it's per, especially in the parts where you're writing as a really young kid and trying to understand things and not even looking back uh, with the retrospective of, of an adult on, on events that transpired during your youth, because you kind of do it in, in somewhat of a chronological order. But first of all, I wanted to start off with the fact that you were born to a mother who um, was not originally a Muslim, who was born in Pittsburgh, um, and a father who was born in Egypt. And I thought maybe you could sort of give the audience a sense of how they met and what role religion played in their union, even before you were born. Sure. Well, you know, my mother, uh, like many people in their early 20s, was sort of on this spiritual journey. And uh, she found an old dusty book in the library uh, about Islam and she began reading about it and became interested and uh, she went to the local mosque in Pittsburgh and uh, just, you know, to inquire about more information on the religion and uh, they were very welcoming to her and uh, to my sister who she had uh, from a previous marriage um, and she just started, you know, interacting with the people there and learning more about the religion. Uh, and eventually realized that she wanted to convert to Islam. Uh, and actually, the evening that she converted to Islam was the same night that she met my father at the mosque. And your, and your father started off as somewhat religious. How would you describe him? He'd come from Egypt. Um, they met and married within a 10-day period, which is not the usual Pittsburgh girls' courtship. Um, so how, <laughs> how would you describe his religious background? Uh, you know, he was pretty moderate. Um, you know, he didn't drink. He uh, he didn't eat pork, um, but he was you know very devout. He made his five prayers a day, and uh, and you know coming here, I think that his connection to the Muslim community in Pittsburgh was a way of you know kind of experiencing home a little bit, and uh, and I, I think it gave him a sense of familiarity. Uh, so he spent a lot of time there. They actually met the. Uh, while he was at a prayer study and um, the, the woman that was helping my mother uh, convert asked if she would mind converting in front of the men upstairs. See, the process of converting to Islam is basically when someone says what's called the Shahada, uh, which is a declaration of faith. Uh, and, uh, and she reluctantly kind of shyly agreed. And uh, she said the Shahada in front of this group of men and uh, my father kind of locked eyes with her for a moment. And uh, as she would tell me later, you know, she said he looked so Egyptian. And a few days later, she got a phone call from her friend saying that one of the men from the group would like to meet with her and talk to her about potentially getting married because there's no dating in, in Islam, really. Uh, people generally meet under a chaperone visit a few times and it's kind of like a business deal almost they hammer out the details and uh, see if they're a good fit for one another and uh, and then they get married uh, which was the reason that it, it happened so quickly um, and, and she said sure she would she would meet and, and sure enough it was uh, the green-eyed Egyptian man that she'd uh, met a few nights prior and I guess the rest is history and now there's an interesting thing because your mother actually wasn't uh, was a Catholic, and she, after her divorce, went to a priest. And you write about this in the Terrorist Son, and asked the priest because she had questions about the Holy Trinity. And the more she questioned, the more angry the priest became, and then ultimately questioned her faith if she had to ask these types of questions. Was there something about Islam? I mean, because from a Westerner's viewpoint, certainly at this point, we don't see women playing a role as actively questioning. Uh, religious doctrine um, in Islam. Was there something about it that she found to be different in that respect um, in terms of, of her role and her relationship to the religion? Well, I think she just um, found strength in, in the spirituality of it. Uh, you know, women do play a central role in the religion. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, the stereotype is that, uh, you know, that, that women should be subservient to men and, and in some instances, that is certainly the case. Uh, 
But, uh, you know, I, I think there are lots of examples of, of women playing a very dominant role in, in uh, the history of the religion. And, and so I don't think that was something that dissuaded her from, from wanting to join it. I know. I mean, we actually do get that sense because we're looking at a lot of very radicalized, you know, uh, men with several wives and whatnot. And so it becomes distorted what what we're seeing in the United States and what we're learning about. And I think that's why it's important that you talk about the religion, you talk about your what your core family was like prior to your father's radicalization, because there's actually a part in the book where you do talk about them shopping together, her being, him being um, acquiescing to her desires on how to decorate and how to run the home, and, and, and sort of take, she took the lead there. Sure. Uh, you know, he was a, a very loving man and, and uh, very humorous, and, uh, you know, I certainly felt that, uh, that he cared very much for our family, and uh, as she would tell me, uh, you know, looking back, that uh, he cared very much for her and, and her happiness. And, um, you know, although we were Muslim and, and even as a young child, I knew that that uh, wasn't the typical American uh, lifestyle. Uh, we were pretty normal in most, uh, you know, in most situations. Now, let's talk about your father actually became embroiled and arrested for the... Um, alleged, you know, well, the murder of um, the head of the JDL and uh, Rabbi Kahane uh, and the Jewish Defense League is what I'm talking about. And when this first happened, your mother and you went to visit your father in prison. And then there's a scene that you write about in the book. If you could explain what, how the family initially reacted to allegations that he had killed this rabbi. Sure. Well, the evening of, of the assassination, my mother was watching television and uh, her show was interrupted by breaking news uh, saying that Rabbi Meir Khan had been shot and so did his assailant and neither were expected to live. And it cut to a clip of my father laying in a pool of blood. And that was essentially my mother's introduction into this uh, radical ideology that my father had been following. And uh, over the course of the next few weeks, uh, he was recuperating from his wounds in the hospital, and, and uh, eventually when he was healthy enough, they transferred him to Rikers Island uh, in New York, and uh, our first trip um, was very surreal. Um, it was a you know, very gray early morning, and, and um, it just felt very eerie. It was almost uh, ghostly, uh, and, and I just remember... Uh, being taken into the building and, and frisked and, and then taken down a, a long hallway and a guard opened the door to one of the cells and uh, my father was sitting there in a prison jumpsuit and um, uh, we sat down together and, and for the most part it was my mother and, and my father conversing. This was really the first opportunity that they had gotten to have a moment together um, and her main concern was, was finding out from him whether he accepted guilt for this action or if he was claiming his innocence. And at the time, he claimed his innocence, and, uh, and she believed him. Um, for me, it was uh, it's kind of hard to describe. I mean, the first thing that I saw that I recognized that was different was he had this very long scar across his chest and up his neck uh, where the doctors had performed the surgery trying to remove the bullet inside of him and um, and I found it very distracting to the point that I kind of didn't even want to look at my father because I was afraid he would notice that I was just staring at it um, but that would be the first of many years of visiting him in prison and, and having similar experiences. Now, he, he was ultimately, it, the thing, that, well, he was ultimately acquitted. And the interesting thing is that of, of, of killing the uh, Rabbi Kahane. And, and I'm curious about the fact that you chose, that he chose additional counsel, who was William Kunstler. And if, for those of you at home who don't remember your history on this, he also represented uh, the, many of the Chicago Seven um, in the trials that were held for those who were 
protesting the war at the Democratic Convention. Um, and so I, I'm just curious how this devout Muslim who had become radicalized chose a Jewish attorney to represent him. Was that um, uh, purposeful um, in, in the sense to show that this wasn't uh, an anti-Jewish act or just that he picked the best guy for the job? I mean, it would seem a bit odd. Sure. Well, you know, I can't speak specifically to uh, his motivations in picking William Kunstler. I mean, his his uh, name spoke for itself. He was, uh, you know, very, uh, very well known uh, for representing people who most, you know, had negative opinions of. Uh, and he was a very firm believer that everyone deserved the right to a fair trial. Uh, and and ultimately convinced the jury that um, that the likelihood of Kahana being assassinated by my father was the same as potentially someone from the JDL wanting to assassinate Kahana. There was a lot of infighting at the time, so he was found not guilty initially of the murder, uh, but found guilty on uh, assault and weapons charges. So he he initially received a sentence of seven to twenty two years in prison. And, and he found, let's talk a little bit about how we got to the point of even being, of being embroiled in any kind of an assassination attempt. Because he goes from being rather a moderate Muslim, um, by your own description, to getting more and more radicalized. And, and looking back on it, because we were talking about this prior to the show, but we're looking at that situation and from any perspective that you have, how is it that he became radicalized? Well, I think there were a lot of things that influenced the way he began to change. Um, this was the late 80s. Uh, we were, the United States anyway, was in the middle of kind of supporting the the Taliban and the Mujahideen in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. And uh, many Muslim men from all over the world were going to Afghanistan to fight, which was something my father very much wanted to do. Um, we were living in Pittsburgh and uh, my uncle offered my father a job in Jersey City uh, as an electrician. And so we moved to New Jersey and he began attending a mosque there uh, where the blind Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman, who would ultimately be uh, convicted in the World Trade Center bombing, uh, often gave sermons on Friday afternoons. Uh, and I think it was that interaction with those men that motivated my father to want to do more uh, in defense of the religion as he saw it, as men like the blind sheikh saw it, to the point that my father very, very much wanted to go to Afghanistan to fight and even brought my grandfather to America to try and convince him to take my family back there so that he could take care of us while my father was there fighting. Uh, and my grandfather denied him that request uh, uh, vehemently and told him that your family is your responsibility and that uh, you have no business going over there, that you need to take care of your family. And I think because that door was shut for him, that uh, ultimately he felt he needed to find some other outlet uh, to, uh, you know, to make his mark in the world. Well, he actually got injured in his job as an electrician, and you write about it in the book, um, and that uh, when he was injured, at some point after he was injured, you asked him about when he had become such a very religious uh, a Muslim or, you know, had become so religious. And his response is, when I came to this country and saw everything that was wrong with it. And it, it just, it seemed odd to me that this was, you know, suddenly that, uh, it, somebody who just, I mean, they were injured on the job and they're having difficulty supporting their family. It, it just seemed already to be quite a bit of, of anger at the country that couldn't possibly just stem from this one incident. I mean, it just didn't make a lot of sense to me that it must be stemming from a number of different things. So if the U.S. was supporting, um, you know, the Taliban, I know, I mean, I know they were, where did all that anger start to come from? Well, he had several experiences, I think, that made him disillusioned with American lifestyle. Uh, while we lived in Pittsburgh, he was accused of uh, raping a woman who was uh, basically in the Muslim community in Pittsburgh. Anytime someone 
who was interested in potentially converting to Islam would approach the mosque. Uh, if they were very serious about it, they would often have these people live with Muslim families in the community to get a sense of what it was like to be a Muslim on a daily basis. And uh, they uh, invited this woman into our home and, and uh, ultimately she accused him of, of raping her and uh, no charges were ever filed and, and uh, it seemed that she was not uh, telling the truth, but um, his reputation in the Muslim community was destroyed, and uh, and I think that certainly left a, a negative mark on him. Uh, you know, irrationally blaming the West or America for uh, for the trouble that he'd had, and then adding to that the uh, the electrocution while he was at work. He'd received third degree burns on his arm and uh, was unable to work and was sent home on on painkillers and antidepressants. And as my mother would tell me later, uh, he became very withdrawn and, and very with depressed. And and unfortunately, that was around the, the exact same time that he began going to the mosque and listening to these sermons by radical men like Omar Abdul Rahman. Um, so it, it certainly wasn't just one event that uh, that turned him. I think it was many different events in his life that eventually soured him on uh, on the United States. Now, what was it like growing up as he became more and more radicalized? What was he teaching you? What were, was he telling you? How were you being indoctrinated? Because um, you write about quite a bit of it, and it, it seems almost like something that somebody told that at such a young age that you wouldn't be able to come back from it. Well, um, you know, we spent many nights uh, at the mosque with these men and, and listening to them discussing politics and, um, you know, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and, and all sorts of different topics that, uh, that you know, fomented the emotions of, of the men there. Um, you know, but my father basically did what uh, what many people who become fanaticized do. They they try to isolate you and convince you that anyone that isn't like yourself uh, is evil and a, a potential threat. And so I, I grew up uh, harboring negative stereotypes about pretty much any person that, that wasn't just like me. Um, and in some ways, the fact that he went to prison and his ability to communicate all of that to me on a daily basis, uh, perhaps saved me from from becoming fully radicalized. So I, the thing that I'm curious about is where was your mother when all this was going on? Because you don't write about her as being particularly convinced. I mean, it, actually, you write about her being somewhat concerned about his radicalization, his withdrawing. So as he is teaching her son to to hate just to, to hate Jews, to hate homosexuals, to hate just about anybody that's different than than uh, he, where is your mom? You know, I'm not certain that she uh, that she was aware how radicalized he became. Uh, you know, he this happened in a very short period of time, um, over the course of less than a year, uh, where he began to change, and she noticed that he was starting to change. But for her, it mostly meant that he was spending less time at home. Uh, spending more time in the evening at the mosque, she wasn't exactly sure what he was doing. Just that uh, that he was becoming more impatient uh, with American foreign policy, and um, you know, as far as him wanting to go to Afghanistan and fight or anything like that, uh, you know, she saw it as as something that jived with the United States' stance on what was going on over there. So. Um, you know, I don't think that uh, that she had a real sense of just how radical his views were becoming until the night of the assassination. So after the assassination happens, you're forced to leave, to constantly move around, and your childhood becomes somewhat of a nightmare. Could you just sort of give us a, a some sort of an overall of, of what happened after your dad was imprisoned and you went to, I mean, you did go to visit him, but prior, from 1990 to 1993, what was happening in terms of your day-to-day -day life? Well, the night of the assassination, we left the house, uh, basically carrying whatever we could manage to carry in our arms, and uh, we never returned to our house. Uh, we stayed with our uncle and his family in their apartment in Brooklyn for a few months while uh, 
uh, the trial was going on and um, we, you know, my mother had lost her husband and then uh, our father and the breadwinner in our family and um, we basically went from being, for the most part, a, a relatively normal uh, middle class family to uh, to being very poor and, and uh, basically my mother trying to scratch uh, every bit she could out of the world to uh, to help her feed her children. Uh, we, it was just very unstable. It went from being a normal family to having to deal with reporters and the FBI. Well, actually, the FBI wouldn't happen until after the World Trade Center bombing, but uh, the New York Police Department and lawyers and death threats. And uh, it basically turned her whole world upside down. When your father was arrested, they seized a, a bunch of materials, which I think is an interesting aspect in the book that they failed to properly cull through because they felt some of it was just uh, poetry. Um, and they missed plotting already that was happening in terms of the World Trade Center. Is that correct? Yes. The initial NYPD investigation, it concluded that my father was a lone gunman and uh, that he wasn't a part of any larger group. It wasn't until after the World Trade Center that they realized that he was, in fact, part of this larger cell of men. Did, while you were moving around, I mean, did you feel hatred towards the people that had imprisoned your father? Did you find yourself feeling more radicalized um, about because of the pain that the family was going through? I mean, and, and what did your father tell you about who was to blame for his, cert, his current predicament? You know, it may sound strange to say, but uh, I was seven years old and, and I really wasn't old enough to, to question those sorts of things. I, it was just, your father is here. This is what we have to do in order to see him. And, um, and for the most part, our, our visits generally revolved around my mother and father talking about his court cases and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, you know, I, Unfortunately, I try to look back and, and it seems as more time goes by, the, the less I can really remember much of the interactions that he and I had before he went to prison and after. Um, he, he and my mother basically were trying to, uh, you know, work this court case with the, with the lawyers and, and, uh, and that's mostly what uh, what our interactions were like in prison, um, generally around the holidays and that sort of thing, we would uh, act more like a family even to the point that uh, when he was transferred to Attica uh, State Prison in upstate New York, uh, we would spend you know three days and two nights inside of a small home. Yeah, we, so, yeah you put a picture of that in your book. I mean, if we could put that up. Well, go ahead. Yeah, um, surrounded by barbed wire fences in, in these tiny little homes and we would pretend to be a family and you could rent movies and there was a playground and uh, I think my mother tried to make the visits as normal as possible for us just because uh, I think, I don't think I know that she tried her hardest to shelter us from the news and, and, uh, and information about the case and that sort of thing. Now, when was it that you finally decided that you were going to break off, um, uh, I mean, break off with your father? Was it when he was um, rearrested, I mean, or charged with conspiring to bomb the World Trade Center? And if you could, could you discuss that day and, and what it was like when you found out that, the, tra that a, a, the Trade Center had been bombed underneath in 1993? Sure. Um, you know, after he initially went to prison, went to prison for the Kahan assassination, although he was found not guilty, um, there were, just from hearing the whispers of, of certain people in the community talking, um, there were ways of, even if he was guilty, justifying what he had done. The JDL was the largest terrorist organization in the United States at the time of Kahan's assassination. So many people saw it as one extremist killing another extremist. And as a child, I, I kind of held on to that thinking that, okay, well, you know, if he did do it, then he, he killed a bad man. Uh, after the World Trade Center bombing and innocent people were not only being attacked but were killed, there was no longer that excuse to hold on to. 
And even later in life, I realized that uh, the excuse of, of trying to use violence to attack a man like Kahana only made the situation worse, and, and that uh, that sort of violence only perpetuates the problem. Uh, the day of the World Trade Center bombing, I was actually homesick from school, and uh, much like my mother's experience, I was watching television and it was interrupted by news saying that there was a large explosion in the World Trade Center. They thought at first that it was uh, an electrical transformer, and so uh, you know we we weren't really used to that kind of terror attack uh, here in the United States, certainly. Um, and it wouldn't be until many months later that uh, that my father's role in that plot. Uh, overall, there was a much larger plot referred to as the Day of Terror plot, in which a, a dozen New York City landmarks, uh, the United Nations headquarters, synagogues, the Holland and Lincoln tunnels, uh, as well as a, a few other landmarks in the city, they had planned on on bombing one after another. There was supposed to be seven minute intervals between all of these explosions, and thankfully that plan was foiled by the, uh, by the help of an informant in the group. Um, but for me, it wasn't this singular moment. There were many small experiences that I had that eventually made me realize uh, that what my father believed was, um, you know, it was not only irrational, it was, it was, uh, it was unfair and it was wrong. And, and uh, there is no amount of uh, violence that we can use to, to solve these problems. It's not about uh, taking out people we disagree with. It's about trying to find a way to coexist with each other, whether we agree with one another's viewpoints on the world or not. What were some of the events in your life that began to change your worldview? Because it's, it's kind of interesting, and you talked about a few of them in the TED Talk. Um, they're certainly outlined and I mean, written about in more detail in your book, a Terrorist, uh, The Terrorist Son. What were some of those experiences that made you question the teachings that your father, you know, the experiences your father had taught you during the small amount of time that you were together? Well, first, I would say that you know it wasn't just the lessons that he had tried to teach me. The result of his actions had created such instability in our family, and uh, you know I'd moved twenty times by the time I was nineteen, and uh, it was normally from one bad neighborhood to another, uh, whether it was uh, across county lines or state lines. Um, we moved around so much, and I was always the new kid, and and. Um, you know, I was very, very isolated, which, as I said, is a very important ingredient in, in keeping in either creating fanaticism in someone or keeping someone fanaticized. And in a lot of ways, that instability and, and my isolation allowed me to hold on to those negative stereotypes. Um, what helped me to break free from them was really interaction and being able to... Uh, you know, interact with uh, the people in my environment around me. I remember the first time that I made friends with uh, a young man who turned out to be Jewish, and I didn't know that for the first few days as we were becoming friends. And I remember when I found out that he was Jewish that uh, that I, I felt uh, immediately almost a sense of pride because I felt like I had done something that for most of my life I'd been taught was impossible. Uh, you know, not only could Muslims and Jews not be friends, but they were natural enemies toward one another. And, and uh, that experience flew in the face of what I had been taught. And that was really one of the first instances where I started to question uh, the stereotypes that I believed and, and the ideology that I had been led to believe was the truth. Uh, and then um, a few years later, I, I began working at uh, Bush Gardens, an amusement park in Florida. Uh, and that was really my first chance to interact with gay people. Uh, I made friends with uh, one of the dancers at a show there, and, uh, and he was so kind when he had no reason to be. And he was so supportive when I told him that, you know, I liked theater and, and that sort of thing when he had no reason to be. And I imagine my reaction toward him uh, wasn't hidden very well, that I had <laughs> disdain for the fact that he was gay. and um, and. Because I'd been bullied so much uh, moving around, I had a very intimate understanding of what it meant to be victimized. And I realized that this person who was kind to me 
uh, who was supportive and, and, and a friend, really, who had really no reason to be that way to me, uh, was acting in a way, you know, he was, he was better than me. And I didn't want to make people feel the way I had been made to feel when I was being bullied. And, and uh, he really opened my eyes to this idea that, uh, that we should treat people the way we, we would like to be treated. And it, and it brought me back to many of the lessons that my mother taught me as a child about not judging a book by its cover. And, and, and that experience made me look at the world with a more open mind and, uh, and, and just kind of take in the experience of, of interacting with all sorts of different kinds of people and, and just trying to understand one another instead of building these walls like I had done for many years and, and isolating myself from, from being around kind people, you know? I'm just curious if, if, in during these types of interactions, when you're talking to different kinds of people, do you avoid the topic of politics, and and can, do you bridge these gaps by keeping those conversations uh, apolitical and more about whatever it is that you're doing uh, with that particular friend? Um, you know, I don't I don't make any particular effort not to talk about uh, about politics. I think in general. Uh, we need more interacting with each other and less debating and, and uh, because I think that's where you create the foundation to see each other's viewpoints uh, without becoming hostile to one another. Uh, that's one of the reasons that I've been involved in interfaith dialogue, uh, you know, in these last five years that I've been speaking publicly. And um, and I don't just mean that, you know, we, we bring everyone to into a room to debate. Uh, who's right and who's wrong about any particular issue. It's just uh, interacting with each other, uh, you know, uh, working together to try to better our communities. Um, uh, so, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so, you know, so I don't make, uh, it's often better that we, you know, when we interact with one another, we naturally, I think, have a tendency to see each other as human beings rather than stereotypes. How is it possible in this day and age to raise um, even a, you know, a radical Muslim, to keep them isolated from the rest of uh, other Americans of different faiths and different nationalities? How does that work and, and how is that possible? Well, I think it's about the environment that you create around them. Uh, and that goes for someone who's being radicalized uh, to want to commit you know, violent acts uh, in the name of uh, Islam or in the name of Christianity or in the name of any other religion. Um, you have to convince them that everyone around them is is a threat to them and to their way of life, uh, that they are an existential threat. Uh, and it's that fear, really, that causes people to react in such a way. Um, and so that's why I, I, I talk about not giving in to that fear. Uh, to open your your eyes and your mind to the possibility of, uh, of of not having to agree with someone in order to respect someone, uh, you know those are kind of the, the lessons that I try to impart in, in the lectures that I give. Uh, that that we don't we don't always have to be best buddies uh, or agree on every single subject, but um, but it's up to us as as human beings to be able to live with one another without trying to kill each other. And what is your religious affiliation today? Uh, I'm an atheist. Okay. <laughs> and did you ever talk to your father, this is my last question, about where you've come to at this point in your life? I did try. Uh, for many years, we disconnected any kind of communication with my father after years of visiting him in prison and, and taking his phone calls and, and writing letters back and forth. Uh, eventually, we decided as a family that we uh, that we wanted to try to start over and, and without this uh, without the shadow uh, over us. And about 10 years of silence uh, between he and I ended one day uh, when I got an email from the Bureau of Prisons saying that my father wanted to be in communication with me. And I knew that that I wanted to talk to my father. I had 
these questions that I had thought for many, many years uh, about, like, why would he choose, you know, these actions over being with his family? I mean, remember, he wasn't sentenced to life in prison after the Kahana assassination. Uh, he would be out of prison today uh, if it wasn't for his involvement in the World Trade Center plot. And I not only did I have these questions about his motivations, but I was also um, very much wanting to let him know just how his actions affected our family uh, and, and how difficult it was for my mother in particular after he went away to keep us together and as a family. And so I, I agreed to the communication and, and we began talking and, and he told me that, uh, that he supported what I was doing and speaking publicly in, in trying to promote a, a peaceful uh, resolution to conflict around the world. And, um, it was very difficult for me to figure out if what he was telling me was what he really believed or if it was just what he thought I wanted to hear because he very badly wanted to be back in communication with his family. Um, and eventually when he found out that I was no longer a Muslim uh, and I expressed to him just how negatively his actions affected me as an adult, he basically summed it up with, well, you know, my actions were all God's plan. And if I just came back to the religion that I would be totally fine. And, and you know, obviously that wasn't something that I was interested in hearing. And, um, and I think in some ways it was my own fault because I was naive in going into it, thinking that I would ask him these very deep questions that I had thought about for many years and he would answer them truthfully. And, and we would come to, you know, some, uh, grand illumination, but, um, I decided after realizing that this wasn't really a healthy conversation for us to be having to end our communication. And um, after many months of really kind of absorbing the experience of having been back in communication with him, I realized that in many ways he did answer my questions, that his view of the world uh, was very narrow-minded and very simplistic. And we don't live in a simple world. We live in a very complicated world that requires answers with nuance. And and his ideology not, did not have that. And I think that's why he was led down the path he was. Well, thank you so much, Zach. Um, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. And I want to tell everyone they can watch this interview. I hope that you guys will subscribe. I look forward to hearing your comments. And you also can see Zach doing the TED Talk online as well and read his book, The um, Terrorist Son. It's a great book um, and very, very interesting and very, very honest. So thanks for being here and we'll see you all next time. Mm -hmm.